Hello, I'm Lena Goelke and I'm a student at the Institute of Smart Sensors at the University of Stuttgart. Today, I will present you our IoT-based, low-cost, heart rate measurement system employing PPG sensors. The topics for today's presentation are the motivation, a general scheme of the project, the measurement method, the measurement setup, the algorithm for heart rate measurement, for synthetic data set and for real data, and then in the end, I will draw a conclusion and show our future work. To come to the motivation, Colombia has around 48 million people and 11 million of them live in rural areas. Only 17% of these people have access to health services and many of them have to travel one up to three days to visit the nearest doctor. In 2008, the most ambitious digital project of the Colombian government started. This project is called Vive Digital. The goal is to massify internet access and develop a digital ecosystem for the whole country. Colombia Viva Digital facilities provide internet access and have computers with a high presence in rural areas. To face this problem I just mentioned, our idea is to develop a low-cost measurement system for automated screening tests stationed at the Viva Digital facilities so that the people living there can measure their heart rate themselves. Then these data are made available online to the medical staff who electronically communicate their first diagnosis and treatment suggestions to the patients. So now we come to the general scheme of the project and here you can see our data acquisition section. So up to now we are only measuring the heart rate, but in future we will also be measuring blood pressure. And then we got a control section, which is written in Python. And this control section connects the data acquisition section with the user interface. The user interface contains a database and a website. And the website, with this one, the patient can communicate with the data acquisition section. So it can start the data acquisition and it can also see the results. And then the results can also be emailed to the patient. So now we are coming to the measurement method. So the measurement method we chose is photoplethysmography. But first I want to say some words about heart rate. Heart rate is the number of heart contractions per minute. And for medical examination, the resting heart rate is measured. A normal resting heart rate lies between 40 BPM and 109 BPM. And the heart rate is the number of peaks of one PPG signal in 60 seconds. So what is photoplethysmography? Photoplethysmography is an optical volumetric measurement of an organ. Thereby, a light emitting diode illuminates the skin and a photodiode obtains changes in light absorption. If a pulse wave arrives, as you can see up here, there's more absorption. And if there's no pulse wave, there's less absorption. So here you can see a PPG signal. A PPG signal contains a DC and an AC component. The DC component contains information about the absorption of non pulsatile tissue components and average blood volume. And the AC component changes synchronously over time. This is caused due to changes in blood volume with each heartbeat. And for heart rate measurement, blood pressure measurement and oxygen saturation measurement, only the AC component is needed. Here you can see our measurement setup. So one sensor is located at the tip of the index finger and the other sensor at the medial side of the wrist. And to protect the sensors from ambient light disturbances and to attach them to the body, 3D models were developed. The sensors are connected via I2C with the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi sets up the two sensors, does the data acquisition, saves the recorded data and also runs the algorithm. And then we got a website which is used to start the measurements and to show the results. We used a synthetic data set to develop and evaluate our algorithm. The synthetic data set contains 192 PPG signals which represent heart rates from 30 BPM up to 200 BPM. Now I want to show you our algorithm step by step. So we start with the well measured signal which you can see down here. And from this signal, we calculate the power spectral density. And then this power spectral density, we digitally filter with a cutoff frequencies of 0 0.45 Hertz and 6.7 Hertz. Then from this signal, we are doing peak detection. All peaks detected are marked by a purple cross. 
What we are looking for is the first peak, which has to be found correctly as it is used for heart rate calculation. And all the peaks occurring due to noise have to be neglected. To neglect the peaks, we start with the peaks which have an intensity lower than 6% of the highest one, because these peaks are caused by noise and interferences. These peaks are marked with the red circle and crosses down here. And then all peaks with a distance of less than 0.4 Hertz are considered. And 0.4 Hertz is chosen as the minimum step size due to the smallest human heart rate, which is 30 BPM. And this heart rate corresponds to 0.5 Hertz. So now there are different scenarios to look at. The first scenario we're looking at is if there are two peaks which have a distance of less than 0.1 Hertz. If this is the case, we are merging these two peaks to one new peak marked up here with the red cross. The next scenario we are looking at is if there are three peaks which have a distance of less than 0.4 Hertz in a row, then it is likely that two of them have their origin in side lobes of the windowing function, which is used for power spectral density calculation. So if it is the case that there are three peaks with a distance of less than 0.4 Hertz, we check if there's one peak which is 20% higher than the two other ones. If this is the case, we are deleting these two peaks. If this is not the case, we are just deleting the two outer peaks. Another scenario we are looking at is if there are more than three peaks in a row which have a distance of less than 0.4 Hertz. So if this is the case, we just take the first three peaks and doing the same as I just explained for only three peaks. And after that, if all peaks are checked, we are going to the next step. Down here in the picture, you can see the turkey's line. And this turkey's line corresponds to the reference measured heart rate. And the gray lines correspond to the harmonics of this reference measured heart rate. And in the last step, the algorithm checks if the first peak is a fundamental of the second one. And if this is not the case, it checks if the second one is a fundamental of the third one. And if this is the case, the first peak originates from noise and has to be neglected. In the end, the first remaining peak, which is marked here with a green circle, is used for heart rate calculation. We then evaluated our algorithm. So there's no false heart rate detection due to selecting the wrong spectral peak. And the maximum deviation of our calculations are plus minus three BPM, which is really good because commercial pulse monitors normally have a deviation on up to plus minus five BPM. After we got good results with our algorithm for the synthetic data set, we are now using it for real data. We extended this algorithm by the blue and purple blocks. The first extension we made is up here. So we are normalizing the signal to not be dependent on absolute values. And another added feature, to not be dependent on short-term disturbances, we are calculating the heart rate three individual times. One time for the whole signal, one time for the first half of the signal, and one time for the second half of the signal. And then we are checking if the heart rate of the whole signal is within a deviation of plus minus 10 BPM of the heart rate of the first half and of the second half of the signal. And only this is the case, the calculated heart rate is showed as valid on the display. Otherwise, the patient is requested to measure again. And to get a more reliable result, we are checking if the peak of the red signal, which is chosen for heart rate calculation, is also the highest peak of the added signal. Next, I want to show you two measurement results. So one measurement was made while the finger was moved, and the other measurement was made with a steady finger. From the signal of the measurement with a steady finger, you can see a clear shape. And the highest peak is the peak corresponding to the heart rate. And all the other peaks correspond to the heart rate as the fundamentals. In the noisy signal, you can see that the noise due to movement is in the lower frequency range, which you see up here. In both cases, the heart rate could be calculated correctly, but we can clearly see that we got problems by affection due to motion artifacts. And to reduce these problems, the patient really has to hold the finger still. And also the algorithm has to have a really good noise cancelling. Our results are based on 45 data sets. In 70% of the cases, the algorithm calculates a heart rate within plus minus 10 BPM of the reference value. And in 62%, the deviation is even better than plus minus 5 BPM. 
due to patient motion during measurement, in about 29% of the cases, the algorithm requests the patient to remeasure. And in only 2% of the cases, the heart rate, which is displayed, is outside a range of plus minus 10 BPM. Now I just want to draw a conclusion and wrap up what we've done. So we got a device which up to now can measure the heart rate, but in future we'll also be able to measure blood pressure and blood oxygenation. But that's not all. We also want to develop respiratory rate measurement and body temperature. This acquisition section is connected via I2C with a Raspberry Pi, which runs a data set. And then we have a website so the patient can communicate with our device via the internet and the doctor can also access all the data. So in future, at first, we are going to develop blood pressure and blood oxygenation measurements, and then we are going to do field studies. So which I just want to mention in the end is that we think it's really good that we can connect the engineering and the scientific knowledge to solve problems and improve people's living conditions. Last but not least, I want to give a big thank you to the co-authors, Frederic Dreyer, Monica Pimiento Alvarez, and Jens Anders. Thank you very much for listening, and I will be happy to answer all your questions.